Yes. Yeah, evening all. Um, yeah, we'll just uh, get straight into it. Um, uh, just a bit about the farm. Um, I'm farming at home with my father. Um, we're based in Virginia, South Wales. Uh, we're currently 225 acres now. Um, we're a hill farm ranging from 500 feet to about 1,300 feet above sea level. Um, our annual rainfall um, is over two meters um, a year, um, 80 inches. Um, our 2021 uh, lambing, we're uh, lambing at 620 ewes, which is consisting of um, 560 ewes, and uh, we're lambing 60 ewe lambs this year. Uh, and running 70 uh, dry. Um, we single side mating all to top EBV sires, um, mainly through the ramp compare project, but um, because we've seen it working uh, in its in its flesh, um, everything is EB, EBV, uh, top EB, EBV sires on the farm. So 400 of the ewes are uh, Texel mills, uh, we made them with um, uh, Texel, Hampshire Down and Charlie this year. Um, most of them are on the project, but um, some, and yeah, most of them are on the project. And then 160 then, uh, Welsh mules, uh, we made them to top EBV Texel tips uh, for replacement. Um, and we look for, um, well, high everything, but uh, especially top maternal traits um, as we're keeping them for breeding new lambs in. Um, the 60 ewe lambs that are in lamb this year, we put the blue texel tips um, and previously we've used the blue texels and they were nice easy lambing um, and good carcasses. So um, we could have a go this year. Um, a bit about the farm. Uh, lamb have been doors and feed pit silage. Um, uh, we purchased a, a Keenan feeder in uh, 2014. Um, so we've started the TMR. So we, or if you analysing our silage and doing streets uh, to make up the ration, um, you know, to get it up to, to scratch the requirements of the ewes. Um, EIT record all the ewes and taps. Um, everything's close, monitored for body condition score, um, regular weighing of the ewes. Um, single side made everything for known parentage of lambs. Um, everything's tagged at birth and followed right through. Um, lambs are delivered again monitored every two to three weeks um, and then we act as necessary then um, you know as in worms minerals um, etc um, so just a few milestones of the farm we joined ram compare in the summer 2017 we introduced rotational grazing in uh, spring 2018 and we are growing a lot more grass by doing it um, we become a grass check gb farm spring 2019 so that's a weekly measuring of grass um, on our rotational grazing um, paddocks. And um, every two weeks we're um, analysing our um, grass um, to see what sort of analysis it is and what the sheep are having. Um, and then um, we become a farmer connect demo farm in the summer 2019, um, which is part of tonight's talk, um, doing a few different projects. Uh, we part we part of the HCC carbon audit audit um, late last year, um, and we installed a plastic slatted cheap shed. Um, well, for this for this winter now, um, which is what most of tonight's talk will be on. Um, just to put that in there. Um, been asked to do a bit about the about the MR uh, diet. Um, we in, since we've introduced it. It's a more comfortable diet um, for feeding ewes. There's um, no pushing. Um, the ewes seem healthier. You can uh, introduce and remove straight easily depending on requirements. Um, and we have eliminated prolapses, uh, touch wood, um, for the last three or four years. Uh, we put that down to a more comfortable diet. Um, previously, before the TMR, we used to feed silage and then um, feed the cake or whatever we're feeding on top and they, they, um, they were going bonkers pushing to feed and obviously it was causing stress and that's what we put it down to anyway and there was a lot of theories about what causes prolapses but that's what we think um so 2021 uh, twin ration two weeks pre lambing this year is four kilos of our silage and um, we had probably the best silage we've made this year so we're getting 17 megajoules of energy of that 
and then um, we've added a 300 grams of a 14 mildew blend. Um, so we're having 3.7 out of that, and then um, we added a bypass protein in, um, 100 grams, so it's um, 50 grams per lamb carried. So the twins have 100 grams of the bypass protein. So if anything, we are slightly overfeeding, but it is giving us a bit of um, uh, leeway if the ewes are not quite eating four kilos of silage. So um, just to make sure they're having enough um, to grow the lambs and um, have enough milk. So what does the future hold um, for all of farming? But mainly our, my farm I'm concentrating on, we need to adapt to change. Um, carbon footprint is going to be a massive thing in the future, in my opinion. Um, I think the industry needs to get um, together and um, decide on a carbon calculator that um, they all agree on. Um, you've got the aunties that want the ones which look worse on farming and there's some other calculators that take it to questions and renewables into account, which look good, which I believe in, but uh, I don't know if it's a bit biased or what, but uh, we need to all get together and get it on a carbon footprint calculator that everyone believes in. And um, so we can move forward. If we don't know where our carbon footprint is, um, how can we improve it, um, et cetera. So I think that's an ongoing one, which um, I'm sure there'll be many topics on that to come. Uh, we want to increase our profitability, so we're always looking to uh, reduce things uh, sensibly where, where we can um, and reduce days of slaughter, um, which we are doing uh, via EBVs. Um, we need to grow more grass uh, at the right times of year and um, if, you know, feed the correct diet um, to maximise gains and everything else. Um, so going on to where we want to change. Um, the top left picture is um, our Makip, uh, was our Makip. Uh, every year we had a, a massive stack of muck. Um, every time the farm assurance inspector came out, it was can't put it in the same place uh, more than um, one year running. Um, it was a corner of the field, but when we have over two metres of rainfall a year and to fence that ground out, it's just pretty much impossible on our hill farm. So it's an issue that we've been trying to um, manage in, in the past. Um, last year, we had probably the worst lameness um, at lambing that we've had for, for years. Um, and it went for the sake of not uh, cleaning out, to be cleaned out three or four times once a month um, you know, when the ewes were housed. Um, so it was an extra chore. It was doing our head in. Um, and we wanted to address it. So we have or are. Um, we installed a slatter chair this year, but it didn't happen overnight. Um, we've been experimenting with different uh, slatter systems for the last two years, trying to get our concrete shed um, to adapt. Uh, one of the big issues we had was the feeding, um, because it's all concrete floor. Um, as soon as you elevate the slatted floor, you're moving them away from a feeding passage. So that was a big issue. Um, then we tried to do it as cheaply as possible. So um, we uh, experimented with different methods. So the top left photo is um, expanded metal, um, not the expanded metal views out in Ireland, the, the diamond mesh, but there was more um, security fencing, and, uh, 10 mil gaps on that, on pallets. Um, it worked for a little bit, but the gaps weren't quite wide enough. So then we come by some um, chicken slats. Um, so we elevated uh, the, the chicken slats, um, but the it worked for a bit, but the, the holes were slightly too wide. Um, they were about 25 mil wide and we were having like the odd um, type of view. Certain breeds were catching their feet in it. Um, so obviously, we decided it, you know it went it went right, so we we pulled that out. But um, but we did uh, rear the pet lambs on it, and they seemed fine on it. But because they were a bit later, um, the bottom left picture is um, we tried some pig slats. I think they were um, they were ten mil. Um, as you can see, they, they were sort of clogging up because the, the slats weren't quite wide enough. Um, and then sort of in between the chicken slats and the the expand um, the metal slats. We tried, we imported some um, 
pallets from um, China. Um, they were perfect in most ways, as in the, the gap size, 14 mil. Um, the sheep liked them, it worked, all the, all the muck fell through tidy. Um, but as you can see from the last picture, they weren't strong enough and uh, they cracked. Um, and they're not, well, it's about 70, 75 kilos. So that was after four weeks. So, you know, you can just only imagine what would happen in um, a winter. So, but then the other issue was cleaning out. Um, when the muck built up, you had to clean the shed out and it was a lot of work to take up the slats and then, um, you know, get the bobcat in. It was um, the time you power washed the, the surfaces off. It was just, well, it was just a bit of a disaster taking them up. It wasn't very pleasant to do at all. So we did decide we were going to go with slats and then in the end we um, did bite the bullet and say, right, we're going to do a tidy now with the, the proper ones, should uh, sort of thing. Um, so we had uh, an old cattle shed, um, sort of a bit of a blank canvas, the top left picture, um, just as you can see, just storing fertilizer and bales of straw, um, machinery on the right hand side, just, you know, just a general shed, but uh, we've been thinking for years, what can we do with it? Um, so we decided, right, let's make some use of the shed. Um, so we sandblasted the shed and uh, painted it. And then the bottom left picture, we decided to do a frame so we can lift out, so we can um, clean out um, easily, you know, with a skid steer then or um, whatever. Um, but so then we went around a few farms and had a look at slatted systems and um, we seen some pits and they were working very well. So we thought, why are we messing about with these frames? We haven't ever seen working in action. So we uh, got the excavator in and uh, the rest is history then. Um, we decided to do a big uh, two tanks, um, four foot deep. And um, we decided to go for um, double sided feeding just because you didn't need more slats, we could house double the ewes. Um, so since the last picture, we, we had to um, ex extend the shed each side about um, six, seven foot, just to get the extra feed passage in, because um, it is a quite exposed shed, um, which works for the ventilation and everything. But um, um, yeah, so it was a lot of work. Um, we decided to start the work in about August. Um, and pretty much all of our spare time went up there. So I uh, neglected a bit of fencing and everything else, but um, I'm sure the benefits mm -hmm. will um, outweigh the, the consequences. But um, but no, um, it's one of the, up there, we're one of the best things we've done on a farm. We've done some good diversifications, but um, I class this as a diversification because it's, um, uh, it's given us a lot more options to, um, potentially do store lambs in the future. Um, house ewes, we don't need the straw. I see we had a lot of lameness in the ewes at lambing. There's no moisture on the slats, so there's no um, you know, moisture getting up into the feet and causing feet problems. Um, yeah, the, the ewes are dry and uh, um, yeah, so we pump it up with a slurry tanker then and we can do that um, while the sheep are still in there. and. It was working well so far, and we are we are we are yet to see a, a negative to it. Um, so yeah, um, I think we got a little video of just shed in action. It was um, about a fortnight ago. Um, I sent this to we had a farm insurance inspection, so we sent this to them. Um, a lot of people have been saying about oh, what, what do the farm insurance think of it. Um, they commented, nice shed, so uh, I think that, um, well, we're yet to hear anything back from them. So as you can see, the, the sheep are content on there. Um, we didn't know if they'd lay down as much as maybe they would on straw, because um, there's nothing better than a fresh bed of straw as, as you put it down, but it only takes two days, um, well, in our system anyway, to get um, mucky. Um, but this don't get mucky, it's, it's clean all the time. Um, the odd bit of wool goes on the floor, but we, we rarely pick the wool up. It does find its way through the slats. Um, and yeah, we're, we're very pleased with the shed. 
Um, we use ventilation sheets on the side and we open the doors in the days just for ventilation, but um, you can't smell any ammonia in the shed. Um, yeah, we, we are very pleased with the shed and it's one of the best things we've done. So, um, if, I'm not sure which way you want to do it there, and I'm open to questions, but I think it leads nicely on to what Liz, um, Liz's presentation is going to say. But, yeah. Um, Thank you very Thank much, Rhys. Thanks very much. So, yeah, I think uh, they definitely look very impressive, and and I think you're um, you know you're you're honest enough to say that you have been you know tried it the the, yeah. the right way. Really, you've gone about it the right way. You've you've trialed a few that haven't worked, but hopefully by doing that, yeah. you've you've actually chosen the ones that will work for you. And uh, yeah, it's I think it's obvious to see that they've uh, impressed you so far. Anyway. So we have um, we have had one question in actually. I might as well ask it to you now. Um, so Mark is asking, will you have to buy more inputs to replace what you lose from reduced um, amounts of farmyard manure produced in order to continue to improve soil? Um, so we use quite limited fertilizer anyway. We put a dressing out in the spring, and then we obviously put on our silage fields. But um, we've we've it's, it's straight straight nitrogen sort of thing, um, sheep muck now, there's no um, straw in it. Um, I see we yet to come across problems in the future, but me, it might be another option. Uh, it might be another problem we've come across with a, as in organic matter, but we are looking at it on another project with Farm and Connect, um, organic matter in the soils. Um, but yeah, I, I think we got, um, I think we'll have as, as good a nitrogen out of that because it's been neat nitrogen rather than um, diluted nitrogen in straw and sawdust. But yeah, I see it's new to us yet. I'm sure we'll find some problems uh, in the future years, but <laughs> see us farming, we've got to adapt and change. Yeah, and I think it's fair, fair to say, you know, your organic matter levels are quite high, quite good, at yeah. good levels already. I think you're 11, 12, yeah. 14 organic matter levels yeah. already. So. Because um, yeah, we because we heavily because we heavily stocked um, as a, a farming unit, um, we can't really afford for many fields to be out of production. Uh, spec well, any time of year really. Um, so we our organic matter is always building type of thing. So um, yeah, we, we we don't go backwards. So we just keep what we got. I think. Mm. And then there's one other question about the uh, slurry. How much slurry do you think you'll produce? Um, and how much can you hold? Um, good question. It, it'll hold a winter's worth of um, slurry. Um, as it's just neat muck rather than um, we used to use 26, 28 tonne of straw, um, which obviously in our muck heap, you know, was a lot of straw mixed in with it. Um, yeah, we, we put a lot of water in to keep the water flowing to pump out the tanks. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it'll do a winter on our ewes. So, so it's, I should have said earlier, it's holding um, a good 500 ewes up there. Um, it could hold about 540 with, with a good feed space, um, eight, inch, eight, nine inches of feed space uh, per ewe. So the laying space is um, more like seven and a half to eight. Um, but um, yeah, they seem comfortable enough. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Rhys. Yeah, I think that leads us on nicely um, to Liz's pre presentation, really. As I um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think, yeah, if you can stop sharing your screen that's so, Liz, so Liz can start sharing her screen. There we are. Um, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, we did a, we've done a trial over the last few weeks that Liz will uh, tell you a bit about and tell you the results of what we found as well. So over to you, Liz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully you can see that in full screen. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah. So good evening, everybody. So, yeah, I was um, sort of asked to just help in terms of thinking about how to design this trial just to test different beddings versus slats. Um, so you can see on the slide in terms of the bedding types that were tested was wheat and barley straw, sawdust and also EnviroBed, which is a type of plus, uh, sorry, paper waste. And you can see also the prices that um, were paid. So none of this was funded. So this was paid by Reese and Russell in terms of getting that bedding onto farm. And then they were being, it was being compared against slats. 
what we looked at is lameness levels mainly because um the it was sort of started this sorry it started from a place of last year there was quite a lot high level of lameness in the use um pre-lamming so part of it was to understand whether um, that was related to bedding or that whether there was other things going on. So we really were interested in looking at lameness levels, particularly in comparison to last year, looking at how much of that bedding was being used against um, across those four different types. Uh, again, obviously slats is zero. Uh, Labour use, the cleanliness of the sheep, we also or Reese recorded and the costs associated with that. So they were the things we wanted to look at. And as mentioned, it was run over six weeks, finished sort of a couple of weeks ago now, just, um, and we'll talk through it. So you can see in the photos on the screen, so the top one is sawdust. Um, and I will talk about stocky density in a bit, but they weren't highly stocked within these pens. The one bottom middle is the EnviroBed, so sort of the paper waste, that sort of gray material. And you can see the slats on in the right hand bottom. So, um, and then we'll. So, in terms of first thing we looked at is lameness. So, although it looks quite a concerning pie chart, it was only eight U's across the trial. Um, what was interesting is the high proportion of them were found on the wheat straw, which was the main bedding type used the year before. So, we're not saying it's related, but it's just something really to. to to look further into, which is, do we just see high lameness levels on wheat straw? And um, certainly, I haven't seen that in other in other areas. We had a um, one on sawdust, none on barley straw, none on the slats, and a couple on the Enviro bed. So we did see a difference in terms of lameness. They certainly wasn't at the levels that were seen on the farm the previous year. So again, there's been quite a lot of control. Um, programs put in place this year so the lameness levels were lower but you can see some differences between the bedding types um, so then we were looking at how much was being used this is in kilos and Reese and Russell very kindly uh, well they were done by buckets and um, sort of weighed it out so this is why we've got the information this level of detail so you can see both the wheat straw and barley straw tended to be on the lower side so wheat straw is like around about 350 kilos over that period of time. Sawdust slightly higher, um, EnviroBed slightly lower than the sawdust, see slats is zero. So you can see there is a bit of variation in, in how much bedding was used. So the bit that we're really interested in is how much is it costing? Um, so just, I'll talk you through this, there's quite a lot going on on this graph, so I'll talk you through it. So the blue bars, is the cost of the bedding. So that's a combination of the price that we saw on the first slide and the amount that we that we use that we've just seen. Um, we also put a labour charge in it. You can see it's relatively similar across all of those bedding types. So uh, again, Reese and Russell recorded the time spent bedding these sheep down. Again, because of the trial, um, it was they were doing it via hand rather than any form of um, machine. And then we allocated a, a cost of a 12 pounds an hour for that cost. So you can see there is a little bit of variation across for labor, but not a huge amount. The main variation is in terms of bedding cost. So with EnviroBed, just high, relatively high amount being used and high price getting it onto farm. Um, then when we start to compare it between between ones and this is on a pence per day and this allows us to compare it with what the slats are doing uh, so we have to remember because of the trial and the lower stocking density in those pens for the ones that were bedded the pens that were bedded you saw some images of earlier there was about 2.1 meters per u um, and that's compared to the slats about 0.8 so there is a higher stocking density on the slats part of that is is in terms of they rely on a slightly higher density to make sure that muck gets pushed through yes we could have probably put more sheep in those pens potentially would have affected the amount of bedding that's being used um, but it but those four bedding types were consistent in terms of the number of views put into those pens um, hopefully you can see there's some gray crosses on that screen and you have to read that on the axis on the right hand side and that's pence per day per you so for the wheat straw, sawdust and barley, it was actually really similar around about 11, 12p per day per you. 
um, and you can see Envirobed went up to about 32 pence per day and that was during a combination of just the high as I said the high amount being used and uh, the cost of that product when we worked out the slats and I'll show you how we did that that's coming out about three pence a day in terms of a cost and that's generally about I mean it's a depreciation cost that I'll I'll talk about in a second but you can start to see there is doing quite a, over a 650 years over that long winter period there is a significant soft cost saving to be had by introducing those slats onto this farm. So this is how we worked out the cost of the slats and we and there was two options and we actually put in the price that was the highest, which is the 3p per day per you. Um, so the cost of the slats were £18,000 and that's excluding labour and machinery. A lot of that work was done by Reese and Russell themselves and their own kit. So it's not necessarily fair comparison, but it just gives us a benchmark in terms of that um, product, those the slats going onto farm. They are provided a 10 year guarantee comes with those slats. And we assumed a bit of a residual value after that 10 year period. Um, if that difference is depreciated over 10 years, um, and if the slatted shed is used to house 500 ewes, and so not all of the ewes, but uh, it can house 500 ewes over those 100 day um, housing period, that's where it works out to be three pence per ewe per day. Um, if we just used a slightly different depreciation model, so we assumed it depreciated over longer, but there was no residual value, that's where it was slightly cheaper. Uh, and as Reese has mentioned, the previous one, the one from China, did have some finishing lambs on it. So if we can use that slat, the slatted shed for other, other purposes or other enterprises on that farm, again, the value is the cost, sorry, is spread over more animals. So the next part of it was looking at the cleanliness. And this was done by sort of a score of the U. So uh, with a high number being clean and a lower number being dirty. Um, so again, it's quite a busy chart, but you can see the wheat straw. Um, and what's important is the wheat straw is hiding behind the barley straw. So where you see the grey line with the big blue arrow being pointed at it, it's the wheat and barley straw tracking the same. So basically they performed the same in terms of cleanliness and kept animals reasonably clean until after about four weeks. Uh, the top line is the slat, so the thick blue line that runs along the top is the slats so again was tended those animals tended to be cleanest on the slats uh, we had envirobed that tended to be dirtier and certainly you can see the yellow line stops at week five the decision was taken to end the trial at that point just because it wasn't really providing a very nice bed for those sheep and there were some concerns about that um, and you can see the sawdust was performing quite well in the beginning um, but then reduced in terms of cleanliness for those ewes and as Reese pointed out the other day which normally after four weeks they would routinely muck out those sheep pens so it sort of fits with it lasts about four weeks and then we have to and then a, another bed needs to be established and that's my slide so it was I think it was interesting to demonstrate that there was some differences in lameness, there was some differences in cleanliness, but the key factor was the decision to put the slatted sheds up and there's been various versions of it um, made most sense from a cost perspective for this farm. Thanks very much Liz. Um, yeah, I think interesting results. Um, and like we've seen already, I think Reese and Russell have been um, very impressed by the slatted flooring. Um, so I think we've, we've had some questions in, but I think I would be quite keen to get Tom um, involved at the moment, just if you're um, willing to give us, you know, I, I know you're Henry Van Gogh's local vet, Tom, um, yep. and I know there's um, some um, bit of a grey area possibly with slatted flooring in terms of animal health and welfare, and um, we've had a few questions about lambing on the slats. Um, so if, if you want to give your your opinions on them. Yeah, of course. Um, when I, well, th thanks everyone. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, and good, good talk there, Reese and, um, and Liz. It's quite, very, quite interesting because I've never seen use on slats, sheep on slats before until I went to Hendry from Gogh. And 
kind of my first thing when people start when you know when it was mentioned to me was trying to almost visualize sheep on slats and it was kind of trying to get over that that idea and um, we're very used to seeing sheep obviously on on straw on on sawdust or, or out in the field and getting over that concept i'm quite used to seeing pigs and poultry on slats um, and then I looked at all of the great hard work that the guys were putting into it and all the measurements and everything they were doing. And they were trying to really nail the uh, feed space, the, the water space, the ventilation and everything like that. And then I went up and I saw the 500 ewes uh, in the shed and I was really pleasantly surprised. It, it, they were all pretty much sat down and I don't think any of those pictures that Reese has showed has really shown that off. You I kind of walked into the shed and all the ewes were either content lying down cutting or they were at the feed face. They looked like a normal fit well bunch of ewes, which was really good. Um, agree with the, the comfort um, when they were full of fleece. It would be interesting to see what the comfort was like um, if they're shorn or maybe if they're sort of smaller lambs. The cleanliness was definitely there, um, which can only be good for, for foot hygiene, for Reducing sort of you know mastitis and, and issues along those lines. Um, I was really pleasantly surprised, and I think it could be a good viable option to look at you know for, for other places and to do more more work on um, in other ways. I, I think having the option of doing uh, store lambs on them as well is is a good new enterprise because from a veterinary perspective, bringing new stock onto a farm. Um, especially once your, you know, all of your lambs have gone, you're bringing in a variety of different farms stock and you don't really want to put their worm burden, et cetera, onto your, your ground to affect your, you know, your future lamb crop. So I think having a kind of almost having them like an isolation barn, they never really truly go out onto your, your field. I think that could be quite an interesting concept as well. Another, um, revenue stream. Um, I think it's been raised in a couple of the questions is about, are we able to lamb on them? And as far as I'm aware, we're, we're not, and we are not, Reese is not lambing on them. Um, sort of they're being moved off to another pen. That's correct, isn't it, Reese? They're being moved off to another pen to, to lamb, aren't they? Yes, uh, we, so our existing shed, we brought them uh, down on straw, um, now at lambing. Uh, the day they were starting dropping. Um, we had one or two early lambs that did lamb on them um, and we really didn't see any issue. Um, yeah. It's just our lambing pens are not set up up there yet or are not set up up there to lamb on them. But I would really challenge anyone in foul to come and have a look at our system and uh, tell me why it's not good enough, to be honest. But let's say that's for another day. Um, yeah. I, I would completely agree because I was pleasantly, no, pleasantly surprised by when I when I came up and I was very impressed. I was very impressed by the work these guys have done um, with it, with it definitely. And and I, 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 you know, I think it might be part of that thing with fowl is because it's relatively new and it's different. We we don't we don't know. Do you see what I mean? You have to kind of be a bit of a trendsetter and a and a leader to be able to answer those questions, don't you? Correct. Can I just add a point there, Tom? Like a lot yeah, of the slat, yeah. a lot of the slatted floors, um, historically have been um like expanded metal. Yeah. Um, yeah. these are plastic, um, slatted flooring, which is much warmer and comfortable. Um, so I've been reading and researching. Um, but I think like historic, you know, the, you know, the the comments from foul that people have or the rumours going round are probably what they've said about expanded metal maybe but i don't know it's just i think they should come and have a look really i think they should come and have a look um, the, the only thing to remember is it's not necessarily the lambing on them is one thing it's the thermal comfort of the lambs once they've lambed so do you mean the key thing is to move them into straw or some sort of pen where they can maintain their thermal comfort and that's what slats can't necessarily do very well for very young lambs so, so, so it's not necessarily the act of lambing on them. Yeah. It's the thermal comfort of the lamb post lambing. Yeah, and I think the welfare codes at the moment are saying um, 
you know, young lambs shouldn't be kept on slats. But if, you know, if if sheep are on slats, if there's a, even if they, they're on slats, but there's a run back of straw available to them, then that that still is is fine. So it's it like like I said, it's a bit of a grey area, but um, um, yeah, it's definitely even if you you're doing as you are now, Reese, you know, housing the ewes uh, on the slats pre lambing, it's still saving you. I think that the ewes have been housed since start of January, I think, Reese. So yeah, nine ten yeah. weeks of yeah. housing really that you're. They could, yeah, they come in j just before Christmas, um, but uh, if the start of the shed was ready, they'd probably come in a little bit earlier, but uh, it's just the way it all happened this year. But um, but yeah, it's usually end of day winter we go by, um, and that's from the first to the last two leaving the shed type of thing. So. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think we've, yeah, we've had a few questions in, but I think we've covered... Um, most of them. There's one question here asking, um, was the cost of constructing the slatted tank included in the slat cost? But I think you did mention that, didn't you, Liz? Yeah, again, it was a, a Reese just to confirm. So it's that included the concrete, didn't it, that sits underneath? Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. So that was, that was for the, the slats and the tanks. Um, we obviously had the shed structure there in place. It was an old shed that we refurbed, which was just like a maintenance of any other shed. And um, obviously the the pen uh, the the feed barriers weren't included either, as this just maintenance of you know we only I think it was fair to only include the slats uh, against the bedding options as you need the pens and the the roof and everything else for all the bedding materials. Yeah, and I, I don't know whether Tom just wants to talk about the Enviro bed or your Jean. I know you went to look at the slats, but what was your impression of the Enviro bed when you were out there? Um, it was a bit, bit disappointing, to be honest. Um, from 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 when I was there, it, it didn't seem to be in memory. Reese, it didn't seem to be soaking everything up as well as we thought it would, and it didn't seem to be as as clean as we thought. No, um, we when we tried it and um, had the uh, product first, um, we read a lot of good things about it, saying it was ten times as absorbent as straw. So in theory, we should only have to um, bed every, um, you know, once to ten a straw, um, but that was not the case um, in our climate and our environment. Um, it was using the same amount of um, bedding as the sawdust, as Liz sort of illustrated, um, but the the price was sort of a tenth, um, yeah, which come out in the end in black and white, but. Uh, yeah, see, we always wanted to do this bedding. We, we always wanted to do this bedding trial um, from day one uh, with Farm and Connect, and it was sort of it sort of fitted in perfectly as we've installed the side of the shed to do the the, the trial against the other bedding options. But um, now we've done it. I think we've made the correct choice to um, put the shed in. But yeah, and, especially and, on the you know, short prices. And again, Reese, the. Doing your, as we've discussed, you'll still have bedding, won't you, in your system, but potentially just it's reduced it. Yes. Do you mean it's it's reduced it by 60, 70 days worth of straw for some, for majority of the ewes? Yes. But in we terms of where sorry, where you are bedding now, what are you using? So we're using barley straw. Um that's all we could really acquire <laughs> as we wanted it. So um previously we'd have obviously um, 140 bales of straw, um, but we managed to get 20 bales this year when trailer load but um and it's using our straw as at lambing so we're not we're not wasting any straw as such because they're on the sats so they've come down to the shed at lambing now so they're in a clean bed um by the time they've lambed hopefully we wouldn't have had time to build up a, um, a moist bed um and the sheep will be back out the fields grazing lots of grass hopefully but uh <laughs> on a lameness point, Reese, and you might not yeah. have these numbers to hand. So, obviously, up in the they were on the slats. We had five hundred ewes on the slats. Do you remember how many you treated for lameness in those five hundred? Uh, in the five hundred, there was probably two or three, but yeah. um, they were lame going up there, type of thing. If that makes sense, um, to be in mind. So, so, so new incidents, new cases of lameness was yeah. nigh on nigh on zero, yeah. zero, which, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Has it, has and, it and changed another, now they've come down onto the straw bed? Not yet, because they've only come down yesterday. 
Okay, okay. <laughs> Give them time, but, um, perhaps. <laughs> but yeah, like, um, and just another point, our massive lameness was on wheat straw last year. Um, and we've sort of seen from our project that we've had a hell of a lot more lameness on the wheat straw this year um, in a small number, but scaled up, I suppose, that's the same problem as we had last year with lameness. So if, if it's, you know, it might be wheat straw, so, you know. And because that's curious, because you would, Jean, when working with barley and wheat straw, you would think barley straw is more of an irritant. Both, do you mean it's slightly firmer texture? So that's intriguing. But yeah, I'm yet to find other people who found the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then did we talk? Sorry, I keep interrupting. Uh, oh. And we kept, and we did talk the other day, didn't we, in terms of potentially using a bit of a sawdust as the base, because you can get that locally, and then yeah. top it up with straw potentially. As options. So that's what we did. That's what we did do as the use come down um, yesterday. We put um, uh, a solar space and then we um, use a straw blower to blow straw over the top just as a, you know, so that not too much solar sticks to the lambs and it was just a good bed to soak up. But um, yeah. Brilliant. Right. We've had a few questions in, so I'll just get through a few of these. Um, I think you did mention, Trace, but if you can just repeat um, how long and wide. Uh, the slotted pens are? So the shed is 90 foot uh, long and um, so there's two runs of slats and they are uh, about 22 foot wide and they split down into three then just um, that's where the, that's where the um, uh, uprights of the shed were so that's where we hung a gate so but it's not very handy uh, it's not it's not designed so you can have small pens and if that makes sense. So it's designed to hold big numbers of sheep. And I think we um, at maximum capacity we could put sort of 90 ewes in each pen. Perfect, thank you. Um and I'm not sure who wants to answer this, but I'll I'll read it out. Um can you put straw on the slats, saving to have another shed? I don't know. Liz, do you wanna I, I have viewed that happening? Um but I it it would cripple me the thought of scraping that straw off the slats afterwards mm -hmm. if it doesn't pile up. But I say I don't see why not. But uh, yeah. I wouldn't risk it. Um, and you sometimes see it doing in that sort of hybrid system where you have sort of a a, a solid area with slats. The the general challenge is as Ree said, which is it just blocks. And so and the way doing in terms of how you have to handle that mixture of slurry and relatively dry straw is quite challenging really and so and it is the question which is it's using slats as they should be used and then there's a few questions again about how multi-purpose it is but i think it is if you're going to make the investment in slats then use them as slats yeah yeah perfect thank you um yeah i think we've um had one comment here just saying like the shed looks brilliant but just concerned if you can't lamb in that shed it requires a second shed obviously you know you're fortunate that you do have that second shed um so in theory you're you, you need two sheds but um yeah i'm not sure if if there would be an option to just put slats in in what if if you just wanted one sh a lambing shed really um I, I I, I have you to um, say I haven't looked into it too much, but I, th I think as long as the, the lambs are taken off within a couple of hours of dropping out of the ewe, I think it is all right. But I say I haven't looked too much into it, to be honest. Yeah. I think the bit is that we don't, in, a, in that one shed, you don't have the, you don't necessarily have to have the entire floor slatted. Do you mean it's a component? It could be a part of the shed. And it is as we, it's the individual pens. So the, newborn lambs needing to be on solid on solid floor plus something to nest or to keep them warm that's the key so it's just having that balance between the proportion of slats versus the proportion of solid floors and that could be within one shed um do the ewes pull silage in onto the slats um it was it's something we've been looking at I say it just haven't happened overnight. Uh, we've had sheep housing sheep for well, my father's been doing it forever uh, for the last forty years. But um, uh, but 
one of our, the issues on our uh, concrete shed in our um, feed system is not quite really pulling a little bit of silage underneath the, the gate. So we made it our mission sort of thing of doing a slanted shed that they can't pull in any silage underneath or it, it spills into the shed through um, out when, you know, when it comes out of the Keenan feeder. So, but I think we've got it perfect that the sheep stand there and eat their food because they're not being pushed out the way by one behind them or whatever. Um, so they stand and eat and it's nice chopped silage and um, no, we, we don't see them pulling any um, silage into the slats. And I, I think it was nicely shown in your video, wasn't it? Which is because of where you've got, yeah. how you've designed the feeder is that it, do you mean it encourages their heads to stay down rather than yeah. them standing up and then dropping it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess take, the... uh, research, yeah. Yeah, I guess the message there is do some Real research. Work. Do the research that, that you and uh, you and your father have done to Or copy Reese now he's done all the hard yeah. work. Yeah. It's more like you lose me. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you know, if 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 the situation would have allowed, we would, would have liked to have a an on farm open open day so you could actually see the shed and see the slats for yourself. But Obviously, how things are at the moment, we're not going to have to do with the webinar. But um, yeah, fingers crossed. If the uh, if the situation allows, um, some time in the near future, we might be able to have an on-farm open day, um, and and you know farmers can come and see from them for themselves, which is always um, useful, I think, isn't it? Um, so we are nearing nine o'clock. So I'll try and I think we've got a few questions to go through yet. Um, so what age could the lambs go onto the slats if they're not going out in the fields for whatever reason? Does anybody know? I, I guess, you know, again, it's going back to that welfare code of young lambs shouldn't be kept on slats. Yeah. It's still a bit of a grey area. I don't think there's a certain age. Is there? I, I, th I think it don't help, but farm assurance don't actually know this half either. <laughs> so, but my take, you know, there's a week old type of thing, but I, I don't know. No, I'm just guessing. Yeah. And it, although I don't know the answer, I'm just, I think it's to do with when you can make, when they can make, I'm obsessed with thermal comfort tonight, but it's, it's when they can maintain their own temperature. So I would argue it's a little older than a week. If you think of Cade lambs, when do you stop putting a light on them? That sort of idea, which is really bad. I don't have the actual answer, but I would, they'd need to be a little older, I think, if they were, and that's assuming they're off the mums, I suppose, my, sorry, my debate. Yeah. As, part of my, as part of my research, I've um, seen a farmer and uh, he, he does put them on to slats um, in little pens and he said, well, if they can't survive on cold slats, he said they're not going to survive outside. I thought that was a bit harsh, but um, he's right as well. But I don't know, that was just a comment I got told. Yeah. Um, what make of slats have you used? We used the MIK, uh, I think they call it stepper slats, the 800 by 600 um measurement um so you don't need as many bars in between them and because they bridge over the 800 so it worked out um quite cost effective compared to competitors um we could have saved two to three thousand pound on the slats the slatted floor um but when you look into the background of some other slats uh they were made in china or there didn't seem to be much guarantee with them whereas of putting the investment in and putting them in the floor. I don't want to be changing them. Um, and we've heard a lot of good things about the slats we've put in MIK made in Germany, um, that people have been taking sheds down and reinstalling the, the slats after 25 years. So it sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I think there's one, one comment here, which is, you know, a fair point saying that straw prices do go up and down. Um, so, mm. you know, slats look like a good option when straw prices are high. Um, but obviously, you know, nobody really knows what's the, what the straw prices are going to do in the future. Um, but hopefully, as Liz show, showed in her slides, um, you know, even, even if the price of straw was half what it is now, the, the guarantee and the 20, over 10 years or 25 years of uh, return of investment of the slats still is quite... Um, impressive I think so um and then there's one question here can you drive machinery on the slats um good question I wouldn't just because I don't want to break them and mm -hmm. um apparently they can hold 200 uh, kilos per um slat that's what they rated at um 
I say I, I, we wouldn't go. I think you could put you could put a trailer, you know, um, a Williams trailer type thing on SM in light, but you maybe do not want to put the pickup on it. But um, I don't know. I would, <laughs> if someone would pay me uh, if they break <laughs> to try it, I'd do it. <laughs> no, I don't think it's uh, it's worth it to try it unless you really have to. So, um, and I think yeah, one here, um, just saying, um, did you say you had to add water to the slurry to pump it out of the shed? Yeah, I spoke to a few um, people around the uh, UK and a lot of them with a similar system to ourselves uh, add a lot of water to start, so a foot to 18 inches of water. Um, and they say it keeps it all sloppy, so it um, uh, pumps out easily with a slurry tanker and um, it reduces the ammonia smell. And to be fair, you know, you walk in the shed, it's exactly the same as walking into a straw shed, you, you wouldn't smell any uh, ammonia or anything. So we're really pleased. We didn't know how it'd go because obviously it took a bit of a punt at it, but it is working well. But we are quite ex it's quite an exposed shed where it is, but we put vent vent sheets on the side of the shed, and it seems to be working well so far. And um, I think this uh, comment just to finish off then saying um, I was thinking the same. We had sheep lambing out last night and survived the weather. I think it would be warmer on the slats. So I suppose that's something to, to think about as well. Um, yeah. So I think we've we've tried to I've tried to cover every question there. I think um, so. Hopefully we've answered most of your questions. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's got some closing remarks you want to mention, or we'll just uh, bring the webinar to a close. I think if everyone's happy. Um, so if I just finish off then really by saying um, a huge thank you to all of our speakers this evening to Chris, Liz and Tom who I should mention are all busy uh, in the middle of lambing really all three of them so thank you very much for setting aside an hour of your time to um, speak to us this evening um, and yeah thanks very much to you all for tuning in to watch and for all your questions as well. Um, if you could please take two minutes of your time just to fill in the evaluation form that will be at the end of the um, meeting when you close the meeting, um, just be really useful to give us some feedback on how we can improve these webinars for the future. Um, and as I mentioned, fingers crossed, we'll be able to hold an on-farm event at Hendry Van Gogh sometime before the contract as a demo farm comes to an end um, next year. Um, but for, yeah, but in the meantime, just stay safe and we hope to see you in more webinars in the in the near future. Thanks very much.